Well, good afternoon and welcome to our bi-weekly community engagement webinar. Today is Thursday, January 28th. My name is Deborah Volison and I'm the Director of Community Engagement for Cahuilla Delta Healthcare District. It's always an honor to sit next to our hospital CEO, Gary Herbst, and give you some updates on what's going on at the hospital with COVID or just in general. Um, welcome, Gary. Yeah, thank We're you. We're sitting yeah. here yeah. on this gloomy... I'm still... I'm still trying to get used to your red hair here, but um, I think it looks fantastic. Thank you, Gary. I appreciate that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so we're sitting here on this gloomy afternoon um, waiting for this torrential storm. Yeah. And I only I have a dirty car to show for it. I mean, I'm, they're advising us to get sandbags and to... Um, really? You know, okay. but... It's, it's not looking like the atmospheric river... <laughs> outside right now but uh i hope our weather men and women are accurate about this one yeah we obviously yeah we need the rain, need the rain. And, yeah and um not to gripe about the weather but um we need some cheer in the midst of the gloom so i hope you've got some good things to share with us today and as we start talking about the numbers we've dropped significantly yeah. in the last couple of weeks yeah um and i hope there's a tiny bit of hope in the air with the vaccines. Yeah. We're going to talk about a we lot will. of stuff we will. today. I, 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 will, I will tell you that I think the majority of my remarks today will have that kind of positive bent to them. Good. Um, but I'm, I'm always uh, cautious. Um, apparently, we in healthcare are incredibly superstitious. And uh, so we don't like to jinx ourselves and make uh, too, too optimistic of statements uh, only to, to see those... Um, you know, fall through, so. Yeah, I got really excited when the stay at home orders were lifted. Yeah. But then it's like, oh, now we just go back to the tears. Exactly. So, yeah. okay, yeah. let's jump right in, Gary, and let's start talking about the current numbers. You wanna okay. share that? Yeah, I'll start um, as I usually do at the state level. So as you might expect, the numbers get bigger and bigger and bigger all the time in terms of absolute numbers, um, but percentages, in many respects are what's uh, most important uh, in terms of um, determining the metrics for reopening and, and so forth. So um, the state of California has now conducted 41.3 million COVID-19 tests uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, of which 3.2 million Californians have actually contracted the virus and tested positive. Um, so that's 7.7% of those almost uh, or 41 and a half million people that, uh, that received the, the COVID test um, have now tested positive. Um, but what's more important than the cumulative positivity rate is what does it look like you know, in, in most recent terms. So over the last 14 days, uh, which is the state is always um, calculating its rolling um, 14 days um, as well as rolling seven days, but that's more at the county level. Um, but at the state level, on a positive note, I guess I'll throw in those as many as I can, um, the state has seen a 4.6% drop in its 14-day uh, positivity rate, um, now down to 8.8%. So uh, it really wasn't that many months ago that the state actually was down in the twos. 2.5% um, positivity rate. So 8.8 um, .8 is certainly a, a big jump from there, but uh, definitely we're, we're now moving in that downward trend and that's excellent to see. Um, sadly, um, California, I think, leads the country in the number of COVID-related deaths. We now have 38,224 Californians that um, have succumbed um, to the, uh, the COVID virus. Um, that represents about 1.2% of all those 3 million something that contracted the virus. And that number is actually held uh, very steady uh, throughout the course of the pandemic. I'm, you might uh, remember me saying 1.2% uh, really almost every time we, we broadcast. Um, so, uh, and, and Tulare County is virtually right on top of that. Um, right now, across California hospitals, there are almost 18,000 California residents that are currently um, hospitalized uh, with a COVID-related um, illness. And of those, uh, just a little under 4,400, or about 25% of them, 
are in the ICU. And again, um, that number has remained relatively stable over the last few months. Actually, earlier on in the pandemic, it was consistently about a third of hospital patients were uh, in the ICU. So to be down at 25% mm -hmm. is still a high percentage, um, but again, that number is kind of stabilized. Uh, as Deb was uh, mentioning, um, just uh, I guess it was earlier this week, was it earlier this week? Today's Thursday. Um, the governor announced mm -hmm. that he it's was Monday. lifting um, the stay-at-home orders for all five um, regions throughout California. So Tulare County, we are in the San Joaquin Valley region. Uh, we and 10 other counties uh, make up that region. And uh, we, we did hear a week before last that the governor had lifted the stay-at-home order for the Sacramento region. Um, the Northern California region actually was the only region that was never in the stay-at-home. Um, order. So four of the five regions uh, were in it. Um, but then Sacramento was pulled out. What was kind of interesting is that the, um, the stay-at-home order is entirely dependent on the availability of ICU beds uh, in hospitals in those counties. That it has to be, uh, the availability has to be greater than 15% um, over a certain time period to not be in that stay-at-home stay um, condition. At the time that the governor um, rescinded the stay-at-home for Sacramento, their ICU availability was at about 7%. So far below the 15%, but they were actually using a four-week forward projection of where they thought um, Sacramento, um, the region, would be four weeks from that point. And uh, for whatever reason, um, rescinded it effective immediately that day, even though they weren't going to hit the 15% availability for four weeks. So I didn't quite understand the logic behind that, um, but that same logic then was applied to the other three uh, regions that were shut down, including the San Joaquin Valley region. And um, so as of today, our region has far less than 15% available ICU beds, but it's projected by the state that within four weeks, we will be above that 15%. Also, as Deb mentioned, um, well, that takes us out of that stay-at-home order. We now revert back to the Blueprint for a Safer Economy um, program that the governor had rolled out uh, back in, uh, in the fall of last year. And unfortunately, 54 of the 58 counties uh, in California um, are all in Tier 1 purple. Widespread um, infection, uh, the most severe um, um, tier includes Tulare County, so somewhat happy, somewhat sad. Um, it does mean that outdoor dining returns to Tulare County and um, hair salons and nail salons, um, other personal service vendors uh, open back up. Unfortunately, in-house dining um, still closed down. Um, lifestyle center, our fitness centers are still closed down, so we need to get to the, uh, to the red tier uh, before that uh, tier two red before we can open up for in-house dining and in, in are our those gym. percentages the same as they were like yeah back they, in they haven't changed um, so uh, to move into tier two red uh, your positivity rate that seven day rolling positivity rate has to be below eight percent and the number of new covid cases per hundred thousand population the daily number um, has to be um, seven or less. Um, so, uh, and I'll t for Tulare County, that would mean we'd have to be at about 32 total daily new cases. And, and uh, unfortunately, we're far from that, uh, which I'll, I guess I'll move now into the, the county stats. Um, so, Tulare County, across the, the entire county, 484,000 people living in Tulare County. Um, there have been 372,000. Um, COVID tests that have been performed, of which a little over 44,000 Tulare County residents have contracted the virus. That's a cumulative positivity rate of 11.8%. So 11.8% for Tulare County compared to 7.7% for the state of California. Um, our seven-day positivity rate, um, so again, of all the tests that we've conducted over the last seven days, the percentage of them that have tested positive is at 16.2%. 
Um, so about double what the state is ex experiencing statewide um, over the last 14 day period. Uh, and again, to move to tier um, two, you have to be below 8% uh, from a positivity rate. So at 16.2%, uh, we still have a long way to go. And then there's also that health equity positivity rate. And again, that's taking our county, uh, slicing it into four quartiles and looking at those, that quartile that has the, the most challenging socioeconomic um, conditions there, which, um, you know, much higher congregate living, uh, less access to health care, less access to COVID testing and treatments and vaccines and so forth. Um, their positivity rate is running at 19.1%. So it also has to be below 8% uh, for a county to move into the red tier two. Um, sadly, we've had 562 uh, Tulare County residents that have died um, of a COVID-related um, condition. Uh, and since the beginning of the pandemic, for us, that equates to 1.28% um, of all those that contracted the virus. So the state reporting 1.2, I took it out just to uh, another decimal point um, to show that we're probably closer to 1.3, but pretty much um, similar to what uh, the state has been reporting. Um, one thing I, I forgot to mention at the state level, so in addition to that percentage of the, po of the COVID positive population that, um, that ends up dying of it, um, another measure that is looked at often is the number of deaths per 100,000 population. So at the state level, we're now up to 96 um, deaths. Um, the state of California has just shy of 40 million people. So um, experiencing statewide since the beginning of the pandemic, 96 deaths per 100,000. Um, Tulare County is at 116 deaths um, per 100,000. So uh, we've been consistently running, ranked about number four or five in the state in terms of having, uh, unfortunately, the highest death rate. And of all those Tulare County residents that have passed away of COVID, 78% um, of them were age 65 or older, and 31% of them were residents of nursing homes. Um, on a positive note, um, the county has now received just over 34,000 doses of the vaccine, either Pfizer or Moderna, which are only the two uh, COVID vaccines that have emergency use authorization. Uh, Johnson & Johnson getting very close um, to receiving or submitting their application for that EUA um, authorization. Uh, they reported just the other day that they have the intention and the capability of producing one billion doses um, of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. I haven't yet seen um, its efficacy rate in terms of uh, is it at that same 94, 95% uh, immunity protection that Pfizer and, uh, and Moderna have claimed. Um, the nice thing about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is it only requires one dose. Uh, to achieve um, its immunity uh, percentage. So of the 34,000 vaccines that the county has received, it is now administered 17,320 um, of those doses. So the county continuing um, to coordinate and conduct uh, mass vaccination events uh, for our community at the Tulare Ag Center, Porterville College, and, and COS. And then um, lastly, moving down to Quia Delta. Um, so as of uh, 7.03 this morning, we continue to be an incredibly busy hospital. Um, although it has um, slightly, um, you know, got a little bit easier, uh, we're at exactly 90.0% um, occupancy uh, in the uh, adult acute medical center um, in downtown Visalia. Um, wasn't that long ago that we were consistently at 95 to 97%. So we felt, you know, a little bit uh, um, softening of that, um, but it's still incredibly busy. 
Um, we have 13 of our 41 ICU beds are open, so that's a very positive sign because generally the, the ICUs, the, the one on 3 West and then our cardiac ICU, um, you know, 21-bed unit, a 20-bed unit, they've been perpetually full, causing us to have to open up ICU beds in other units. Um, so we've now been able to, um, to take those out. So the ICU beds that were on 3 West and the ICCU, we've now turned those back into ICCU beds. And, and so it's kind of allowed us to return to a more, a more normal um, use of our beds uh, across all of our different units. But 13 of 41 ICU beds open, um, 10 of our 54 ICCU, so intermediate critical care beds are open, and only 15 of our 249 uh, medical surgical um, beds are open. One of the things that we are seeing on a positive note, um, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this in a bit as well, um, is that we're now starting to see, I guess, a lot more success in actually being able to you know, downgrade to move patients out of the ICU, step them down to ICCU, step them down to a medical surgical mm -hmm. uh, unit, and then ultimately discharge them home. Um, so um, that's been very positive to see, which is what we're really seeing what's causing the, um, the break in the ICU availability, but now the med surge beds have a lot of COVID um, patients in them. Um, we also, the six tower, the 23 bed NICU at the top of the Asequia wing, uh, that's an overflow surge unit for adults. It's completely empty. We haven't, we're not using it right now. And then the 10 beds that we created um, for, again, adult overflow in the endoscopy center, those are empty right now as well. So, um, so all very good. Um, today, um, I just hot off the press. Um, we have 115 COVID positive um, patients in the hospital right now. They're all adults. We don't have any kids right now that are COVID positive in the hospital. Um, I'm a little bit disappointed in the 115, mm -hmm. you know, um, and again, not wanting to jinx us. Um, but again, it was just a couple weeks ago, you know, that we were consistently in the 160s. I think the highest we've ever been through this pandemic was in mid-December at about 170 um, COVID positive patients. We started seeing it uh, drop pretty dramatically. And last week we dropped down to 109. Um, so every day when this report comes out, you want to see, you know, 107, 105, it keep coming down. Um, so it bumped back up to 112 and then today it's at 115. Um, so there's a little bit of disappointment that we didn't continue to see um, that, uh, you know, that nonstop descent. Um, but still, to be at 115 uh, when we were at, you know, 160, 170 um, definitely feels a lot better. And, and also, of those 115, only 13 of them are in the ICU right now. Um, so again, that's a big drop because we were seeing all 41 of our ICU beds full uh, with COVID positive patients. So that's probably the most positive sign mm -hmm. is to see so few patients um, that are in the ICU. Um, all of them are on ventilators um, right now. Um, but interestingly, what we're finding, and I, I think um, this is not what we think, uh, we always think that you know having to intubate a patient to put them on the ventilator is like the last thing you want to do, uh, and and because early on the survivability of a COVID patient on that was on a ventilator uh, was pretty low at about 30 percent, but now in working with our critical care physicians, they're actually finding that intubating a patient earlier um, in their hospitalization actually is a positive thing. Um, that intubating them later um, in their stay uh, has not been as effective as uh, intubating them earlier. And so we're actually having discussions with the patient, you know, and helping them understand because, you know, the last thing is a patient, no, I don't want to be, mm -hmm. you know, intubated. And mm -hmm. to have that discussion, no, this is actually a really good thing and you're going to come out of this and we just need to, you know, really help you with your breathing right now, get your um, oxygenation up. Um, and so I think that that's been one of those positive um, success stories. We do have 52 ventilators that are currently available should we ever have a major surge um, in the future. 
One of the things that also um, very positive is staffing. So we've had um, a little over 1,100 of our employees have contracted the virus um, since its inception, but only 88 of them are currently out on a COVID-related leave of absence. So that's also wonderful news um, to see so many of them have come back to work. That definitely has um, you know, helped our ability to care for patients. Um, we do have four of our patients that are still currently hospitalized with COVID. And with great sadness, uh, just a week or so ago, we lost um, our first employee um, to the COVID um, virus. We've had 31 providers, so physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants that have contracted the virus um, since its beginning. All of them have now returned um, except for um, the physician assistant, Tony Sanchez, that we had lost at the early stage of the pandemic. We're also very grateful to the state for the reinforcements that they help procure for us um, at full cost to us, um, <laughs> but it was almost impossible uh, to find you know, contract nurses, travelers, LVNs, respiratory therapists, uh, but they were able to leverage uh, their clout um, to help us. So we now actually have received nine emergency department RNs, 19 critical care uh, registered nurses, two LVNs, four certified uh, nursing assistants, and one respiratory therapist. And uh, they've signed on till about mid-February. So that has um, certainly brought us great relief in combination mm -hmm. with having more and more of our our, um, our, patient, our employees come back. So, okay. yeah, that's, so that's, that's the, that's that's the current report. condition at the state, yeah. county, and Quia Delta level. All right, well, thank you. So let's go back to the vaccinations. Um, how many of the Quia Delta employees have received the vaccine? Um, so why don't I, instead of just employees, let me, I'll, I'll say the Quia Delta family. Okay. Uh, which all of our employees, roughly 5,100 employees, we have uh, about 700 physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants that are on our medical staff, um, those traveler nurses um, that have come to us, um, as well as um, vendors and our chaplains that work in the hospital and, and have uh, an, a, you know, a greater exposure or risk mm -hmm. of exposure. So, um, so that's the, the entire population. And of all of those, as of yesterday, we had administered 3,184 um, first dose vaccines and 2,397 second dose um, vaccines. We also have given first dose vaccines to 28 of our more longer term um, skilled nursing um, patients. So we still have, uh, what about 787 um, of the second dose to give to those first dose um, Quia Delta family members. Okay, so an employee has the right to decline the vaccine. Absolutely. So what are some of the reasons they would have for declining it? Well, first, let, let me give you a little context here. So um, interestingly, um, you know, we, we have a, a system, uh, we, we have a, a, a web portal called the Quia Compass. And that's the, um, the platform that we use for an employee or a physician to go in and uh, indicate um, what their intent is with respect to the, virus, or to the vaccine. Do they intend to take it? Um, do they intend not to take it? Or are they gonna kind of wait and see? Um, so right now we have 966 employees that we've not heard from. Um, they have not gone into the portal. They have not indicated one way or another uh, what their intentions are. And we'd hope that all 5,100 of our employees would uh, let us know um, of their intentions, but they're not required to. I mean, again, it's not mandatory. Um, so when I consider those 966 employees that we haven't heard from, then we have about 35% of our employees that we have heard from, but they've told us they are either not going to take the vaccine or they're gonna wait. And it's kind of about 50-50 between those that have said, I'm not gonna take it, and those that have said, I'm going to wait. So when you count all of them, 
um, we actually have just a little over 56% of our entire employee workforce that um, has indicated that they are taking the vaccine, which is a lot lower than I'd hoped for and I'd expected. And so the reasons that are generally given to us is that um, I'm nervous, I'm apprehensive, mm -hmm. I'm anxious. Um, we already had a certain number of our employees that uh, would never take the flu vaccine and they would be required to wear a mask throughout the entire um, flu season. Um, that number has dropped dramatically to probably you know, less than 100 employees um, in, a, in a given flu season. Um, but this is a brand new vaccine and obviously it was, uh, it was created done with warp speed. Uh, we don't have much history of it and so I, I think anxiety um, apprehension is understandable. We also have you know, a pretty young workforce and uh, a lot of them say, you know, I'm young, I'm healthy, I have great confidence in my strong immune system, um, and so I don't think I need to take it. I want my own immune system to fight it and develop the antibodies naturally. Uh, we also you know, have more than 1,000 employees that have already had the virus, and uh, a number of them are saying, I don't think I need to take the vaccine because I believe that I have the natural antibodies. Um, mm -hmm. So those are the various reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, they're all understandable. I respect them all. Yeah, I was, um, I was working the county event the other day, and most of the people that were coming through, it was kind of 50-50, not most of, but 50-50 of those who were really excited to receive the vaccine and then those who were nervous and, you know, afraid. And right. probably the same thing with our employees. I, I was nervous. Sure. You know, just because it's something new and um, you're unsure about the side effects. So speaking of side effects, um, is there anything new that's popped up that we didn't talk about last time now that our employees have received those second doses? You know, n none that I've seen. Um, and again, I, um, it's kind of all over the board. It, it's, there's no real rhyme or reason. Um, old or young, um, you know, some people have reactions. Um, some have no reaction whatsoever, like me. Um, I, although I think I can say with the second dose, I might have felt the injection point a little sore mm -hmm. for a few days, yeah, but uh, other than that, I had nothing. Yeah. Um, people having, you know, uh, kind of a minor headache, um, but then definitely people that had full-on chills and body aches and, and things of that nature. So, um, but I think I, I've not heard anything. We haven't really had um, any allergic reactions um, to it, so I think it's gone really well. So does the hospital need um, layperson volunteers to assist with the vaccinations? So I just learned um, this Monday, um, I had a conversation with Tim Lutz, who is the Director of Health and Human Services for the county. And then I think he met with the County Board of Supervisors on Tuesday. Um, they've made a decision to engage a company by the name of Curative um, to kind of take over the operations of mass vaccinations uh, for the county. Um, Curative is the same company that uh, Los Angeles County hired to run the mass vaccinations that we've been reading about uh, that were conducted at Dodger Stadium. Um, Curative has also been hired recently by Fresno County, San Bernardino County, other counties to similarly take over um, their mass vaccination events. Um, so in about three weeks, um, Curative, I think, will be in Tulare County actually running the, the vaccination events at the Ag Center and, and the two colleges. Um, and it's our understanding that Curative actually hires um, all of the, uh, the workers, both the clinical uh, workers who actually do the vaccinations as well as the non-clinical workers that do all the logistical um, planning and, and operations. So um, I, don't, I don't think that just general community volunteers um, will probably have a role in the future, although that certainly could change. We, mm -hmm. we definitely warned the county and curative that um, you know, the workforce availability in Tulare County may not be exactly the same 
that they uh, have experienced in other counties. So I think o over the next three weeks, uh, Quia Delta is going to continue uh, with our staff uh, to support the county, uh, and we will be at the, the Ag Center and COS events. Um, we're actually paying our staff um, to, to be there, although we do have folks that are also volunteering on their own time as well. But um, so if, if we hear anything about curative, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, inviting uh, community members to participate, to be able to volunteer, then we'll certainly get that, out, that information out to you. Yeah, so we've, we've received a lot of feedback from community members um, about the delay on the website, the hours long wait on the phone lines. And so is Curative gonna be taking over that online registration process too? Yeah, that's my, my understanding. And, and the county um, has moved completely away from dialing 211. Um, the county doesn't want you to call um, anymore. It's now all online. Um, you go online and you fill out um, the vaccine interest form that the county has posted there and you submit it and then the county actually reaches out um, to you and, and I've heard I've heard a lot of improvement um, you know some of my own team um, you know those that got um, people they know that got their first dose uh, vaccine they did get a text uh, mm -hmm. from the county informing them of their appointment for the second um, dose so I think the county has now moved into that you know, push mode to, to mm -hmm. get that information out. Um, so Tim had mentioned to me that Curative um, does have its own uh, online registration um, system, and I would imagine they also use texting uh, technology. Um, there, there has to be, you know, for people that don't have, you know, the technology, the internet or, or a phone, right. um, they will have alternatives of the more traditional, you know, phone. Mm -hmm. but. Um, Curative has its own um, proprietary management system that sits on top of the state system. So that's why um, they probably won't be ready to take over operations for a few weeks as they put all those uh, tools in place. Okay. So what is, how is, uh, what's Cuya Delta's role in getting people vaccinated at our outpatient clinics? Yeah, so we've, um, you know, we've, we've really kind of toggled back and forth about wanting to support the county and their mass vaccination efforts versus, you know, being up and running in all of our outpatient sites, our clinics, and vaccinating our own patients. Um, the issue right now is just the, you know, the scarcity of vaccine, uh, which we've all been reading about uh, at the state level, at the federal level, and, and definitely at the county and provider level. Um, so we, we do have um, excess vaccine right now. Uh, we definitely were, were holding back um, a sufficient amount of the Pfizer vaccine to be able to complete those 787 second doses for our employees. But we've already made arrangements to um, essentially redistribute all of our excess vaccine um, back to the county to um, support them in their mass vaccination um, efforts. So, you know, it would be great for Quia Delta to be able to go vaccinate all of our established patients. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's, it's much better for our society, for our community, for our county um, to really be targeting, you know, those 65 and older, um, those that are most at risk rather than our young patients or um, so, uh, we, we're supporting the mass vaccination, uh, first and foremost, but I just came from a meeting um, just before I got over here that um, we have uh, obtained authorization at all of our clinic sites to be able to conduct vac vaccinations of our patients. And so most likely beginning next week, um, we are, Quia Delta in our clinics will continue to receive small allocations um, of the vaccine, probably most likely the Moderna um, vaccine. And we will begin to reach out um, to our patients who are in that most vulnerable, high risk category. So those that are older, those that have underlying um, you know, chronic conditions. Um, so we won't have our patients call into the clinics to make appointments. We will actually reach out um, to those patients and that will be done to the extent of the vaccine um, that we're receiving. 
I do know that um, Family Healthcare Network, uh, who has a very large network of federally qualified health centers throughout our, our county and a very large patient following, um, they are vaccinating um, on some of their patients right now um, using those small allocations that they're getting. So, uh, so it sounds like sometime next week mm -hmm. on a limited basis, Quia Delta will start um, vaccinating our patients as well as continuing to fully support the county in the mass vaccination efforts. So that's at our rural clinics? Yes. Um, urgent cares, no, not urgent cares, just at our rural clinic. Well, the urgent care centers um, and Visalia Medical Clinic um, have been authorized um, to, uh, to be vaccination sites. Um, but I think what I understand is that initially it's just going to be in the four uh, rural health clinics that we have in Lindsay, Woodlake, Exeter, Dinuba. Um, again, we, you know, we have a lot of information about those patients. Those are established uh, relationships with patients. We know their ages, their underlying medical conditions. The urgent care centers are more designed for that walk-in, right. you know, so uh, it'd be difficult to be reaching out mm -hmm. um, to that patient population. So we hope, though, at some point, like the flu vaccine, that we will have, when the vaccine becomes more abundant, um, that we will be able to, to vaccinate people that just show up at the, at the urgent care centers. Right. And just to remind people, don't call the rural clinics. Correct. They will, they'll reach we, out we to We will the, call you. Yes. Right. Okay, so a chat has come in. So do we know when we're going to open vaccinations for teachers? So teachers are in uh, phase 1B, um, tier 1. Um, so this has been part of again, everybody's frustration and confusion is a couple weeks ago, the governor who was similarly frustrated that we were only limiting vaccines to the phase 1A, which were healthcare workers and um, nursing home residents, um, stepped it up and said, no, I, I want counties to start vaccinating everybody in phase 1B, which meant anybody over age 65 or 75 in any profession as well as teachers, childcare workers, um, first responders, people that work in the, in the agricultural um, industry. Um, but then about a week later, a few days later, he kind of backtracked on that and said, no, just now people over age 65. So if you're a teacher over age 65, then yes, you can be vaccinated. But if you're a teacher under age 65, then currently you can't. Um, but now the governor's thinking about scrapping the whole thing around you know, your profession and just saying anybody over age 65 um, can get vaccinated, which again then doesn't vaccinate teachers under 65. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, don't, I don't have a definitive answer, frankly, I, I'm, and I know it's very frustrating, but um, a lot of it has to do with just, you know, the, again, the scarcity of the vaccine mm -hmm. and the fits and starts in which it's coming in. So I, I'm, I'm really hoping that, uh, that as vaccine becomes more plentiful, that we can vaccinate all of our teachers and first responders and everybody irrespective of their age. Yeah. And like everything, in this pandemic, the information changes often, yeah. and we, we just say have to daily, roll with it. Like it's hourly, though. Yeah. yeah, we just have to roll with it. So, a question came in about our oxygen supply, and um, do we have a significant risk of shortages? Um, I don't think so, but obviously, it's it's something that we've paid very close attention to, particularly as I we started seeing our numbers really start escalating, mm -hmm. and um, you know, every day when you have um, thirty plus patients that are on ventilators in the ICU. Um, we were worried, but um, through very careful planning, logistical uh, planning, and uh, working with our vendors, um, we have two different supplies or sources. We, we have portable tanks um, that we use, and those are primarily filled out of Fresno, uh, and we have what's called a one-to-one -one exchange program. So every tank that we empty, um, we get a, a replacement full tank, um, generally the next day. So getting daily um, shipments of, of portable um, oxygen tanks. And then if you've um, noticed in the, uh, 
um, just outside on the west side of the Quia Delta Medical Center downtown, we have an enormous uh, white oxygen tank. Um, that's our bulk oxygen that uh, is piped throughout um, the hospital. Um, we work with a company called uh, Air Gas. We're supplied out of their factory in Pittsburgh, California, just outside of, uh, of San Francisco. And normally, pre-COVID, uh, we use about 30 inches of the um, oxygen in that big, large bulk tank um, every day. We're now using 75 inches of um, oxygen um, every day, so um, almost two and a half times, which would cause um, concern. I, I don't know how many total inches um, are in it when the tank's full. Um, but uh, air gas has actually, uh, they really stepped up. They hired um, drivers and secured additional uh, oxygen sourcing, um, tank, you know, uh, um, secured additional tanker trucks out of Texas and uh, Oklahoma and to, to increase their delivery uh, capacity. And so we get deliveries um, three days a week now to fill that uh, bulk tank. And they've told us that uh, oxygen is plentiful, that we don't need to worry, and that if they need to step up deliveries uh, more than the three a week, then they're in a position to do it. So short answer, we seem to be in really good shape. Okay, thank you. So last, um, during our last webinar and over the last few weeks, we've talked a lot about crisis care. And um, some of the conversations were emotional, it was excruciating. So can you tell us where we are right now with crisis care? Well, again, another one of the most positive um, mm -hmm. themes of the day today is that because of the um, rather significant decline that we've experienced in the number of COVID patients that we're taking care of, the significant decline in the number of patients that are in the ICU and require ventilation and intense resources, um, receiving uh, staffing reinforcements from the state, having so many of our employees that have returned to work, um, our conditions have improved significantly from where we were just uh, two, three weeks ago, where we literally were on the brink of crisis care and uh, we stood up the uh, triage command center. We were rehearsing uh, what it would be like with our physicians and our staff. And uh, I'm excited, very pleased um, to say that that command center has now been deactivated at mm -hmm. this point. It, it's all still intact, um, you know, should the need arise and um, asking people to have a much different Super Bowl celebration um, this year than they might in others because that certainly would be a, typically a super spreader event um, that could change our condition um, pretty rapidly. But, um, but right now, and, and you know, it looks pretty good. Yeah, well, good. So you mentioned the hospital numbers declining really significantly over the last few days. So we're still seeing the high positivity rates, but our numbers dropped significantly. So why do you think they dropped so rapidly? Like in the mat in matter right. of like a week? Yeah, um, I, I would imagine it's multifactorial, as they say. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to believe that um, our community really listened to us, our, our pleas uh, to the community that over the Christmas holiday and New Year's, that they would um, exercise incredibly difficult discipline, uh, but to not have the large family gatherings and the celebrations, and um, because we really believe that was going to be the most important thing that could be done to keep people out of the hospital and to keep people from contracting the virus and, and uh, even dying of the virus. So um, I, I truly believe um, that happened. We're now, what, four weeks out um, from Christmas, and or yeah, probably five weeks out from Christmas, about four weeks out from New Year's. Um, and so I think what we're experiencing is kind of the, the, the decline that we generally see. You know, it's usually the two to three weeks um, after a holiday is when we saw the, the surge in hospitalizations and then it eventually starts subsiding and start declining. So I think that's played um, a really big piece. And so I just like to commend the community um, for doing that. I know it wasn't easy, um, but you absolutely um, had a, a very positive impact. Um, unfortunately, uh, we've experienced a lot of death 
um, over the last um, three to four weeks. It has, you know, been declining, but uh, we were seeing, you know, seven, eight, almost 10 um, daily deaths of COVID-related patients. Um, incredibly sad and incredibly difficult for our staff and, and our physicians. Um, but that also contributed to the decline in the number of hospitalized um, patients. Um, and while those deaths were still occurring, we were seeing that stabilization in number of COVID-related admissions. Um, so that played a, a role as well. I think also, as I mentioned earlier, just greater success on being able to save um, patients to maybe through that early intubation in the ICU and then stepping down to ICCU and med surge and then discharging. I think we're seeing more of that, um, continuing to use you know, all the treatments and drugs and um, different, uh, different treatments like proning and things of that nature. And then lastly, I think I mentioned a couple weeks ago, I was um, giving a shout out to Dr. Bill Holvick. Um, I also talked to Dr. Chris Rodarte of Visalia Family Practice. Um, both of them um, and their colleagues out in the medical community, um, you know, using um, different approaches to treating COVID positive patients on an outpatient basis. So using antiviral medications, aspirin, antibiotics, um, oxygen therapy. Um, there, I, Dr. Rodarte sent me uh, an article out of the American um, Journal of Medicine um, talking about the different types of treatments that were finding success in keeping patients out of hospitals. So uh, I think our physician community has helped contribute uh, to the decline in admissions as well. Okay, thank you. So what are your thoughts on Dr. Fauci's um, latest suggestion that we should double mask? Yeah. Um, well, I think in some respect it's due to, um, you know, what we've been hearing about these COVID-19 variants that are being um, identified in um, parts of other parts of the, the world. Um, we saw one of the first variants coming out of the United Kingdom, um, out of South Africa, out of Brazil. Uh, we definitely now are, have variants in the United States, first seen in Colorado, and now pretty much being seen in every other state. We're hearing that these variants um, are more contagious than the initial uh, form of the, of the virus. Um, more contagious, potentially uh, more deadly. Um, the South African and Brazilian variants which contain a particular strain of DNA or RNA number 484, and I have no idea what that means, but it's present in both the South Africa and the Brazilian variant, um, but that it has the ability to elude the, um, the COVID antibodies that we develop either naturally or through the, the vaccination. And so that has people understandably concerned and uh, so, you know, we, we've been strongly advocating for wearing a mask to begin with. And we had, a, we had Nevin House, our former board president, did a little kind of infomercial at one of our telecasts. Uh, he's an engineer by training, but, um, you know, most surgical masks or medical masks um, are created with layers of material. And that material is porous, meaning it has holes in it that allow us to breathe through it. But these layers of material are purposely uh, um, aligned differently so that the holes don't line up in, say, if it was three layers of material, they're offset. So that it creates a, a tighter web um, so that it, you know, pre creates barriers for uh, the viral molecule to enter through the mask. So the thought is if you put a second mask on, as Dr. Fauci um, says, that it just adds one more layer of barrier there. And uh, double masking, uh, generally you see uh, a surgical or a medical mask and then putting a cloth mask on the outside of that is typically um, how it's worn. The CDC uh, does not support um, wearing uh, two masks. We'll see if they change their position on it. But I think Dr. Fauci is really advocating for the general public um, to, to potentially consider wearing two masks um, because he's also asked that 
um, non-healthcare workers do not go out and you know procure all the N95 masks out there. Um, healthcare workers that are on the front lines that are wearing N95 masks do not wear two masks. The N95 mask, because of the way it's constructed and the material, um, is perfect for uh, allowing you to breathe, but keeping that um, that virus out. Um, so uh, they do not wear double masks. But again, uh, we don't want the general public wearing N95 masks. Um, they're wearing either a surgical mask, a medical mask, or a general mask, uh, which doesn't have the N95 protection. So I think that's Dr. Fauci's reasoning for those people this at second mask can add that additional um, protection. And again, I think it's being done in light of just the, these more contagious variants that we're hearing about. So speaking of masks, how is our PPE level? Yeah, we're actually doing quite well. Um, and I'll give a shout out to Congressman Nunes and Assemblyman Devin Mathis and our own Steve Bajari and our staff um, who have all work together uh, to keep our personal protective equipment inventories um, high. Uh, gloves were our greatest challenge there for a while, but again, the congressman and the assemblyman um, helped pull some strings at the state level that um, freed up some inventory, and we're grateful that that came our way. But um, we appear to be in, in pretty good shape right now. All right, good. So Gary, let's end with just a few updates, maybe on a high note. We've got our emergency department. Um, when you drive by, it's starting to look like an emergency department. Right. So when yeah. are we going to be opening that? Yeah, so we had um, earlier this week on Tuesday was uh, an important milestone. Uh, we had uh, an inspector from the state's uh, office of, oh gosh, Oshpud, Hoff. <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna lose it there. Office Just make of, it up and Office I will of shake Statewide my head. <laughs> Health Planning and Development. Okay, got it. Um, so, anyway, so um, every project that a hospital does is overseen by OSHPUD and is inspected. You know, they probably spent a full year um, pouring over the emergency department blueprints and plans, and then throughout the course of the construction, multiple um, uh, inspectors on site. So, on Tuesday, we had an inspector up in the ceiling. Um, looking at the connection of the existing emergency department with the expansion um, where they come together to inspect all of that. And that went very well. A couple minor findings, um, but easily fixable and probably already fixed um, at this point. So um, I think we are on schedule uh, to complete construction uh, by March 1st. And uh, depending on how, how long it takes for the state uh, to come and do their, um, their inspection, um, the California Department of Public Health to license us, uh, we hope to be seeing patients maybe by the 1st of May. And then on a similar positive note, um, our rural health clinic in Tulare, uh, 11,000 square foot multi-exam uh, room with both primary care, specialty care, uh, behavioral health, um, that is, project is moving along very nicely. We expect to finish construction uh, by the 1st of February and could start seeing patients by the 1st of March. So before I ask you to close, Gary, we just want to remind everybody that we will be posting the recording of this video um, on our website, our COVID-19 Frequently Asked Questions page. When you go there, there's also the uh, written transcripts too. So if you just want to find the question, find the answer, a lot of people will reach out to me and say, hey, do you remember when Gary was talking about the makeup of the vaccines? We can just go there really easily, pull that question and send it off. It will be there. We will also post it in the community engagement Facebook page. So can Lipid, you- Lipid, sugar, salt, RNA molecule, something like that. It so. was, yeah, yeah, <laughs> a lot of stuff. Yeah. So Gary, please close this out today. Yeah, thanks, um, Deb. Um, again, thanks to all of you for tuning in uh, every couple weeks now. Um, you've been at this now almost a year. And uh, believe me, your, your support uh, means so much to us. And uh, you've actually, um, you've elevated um, our knowledge and actually influenced in many respects um, a lot of the actions that we take have taken through your questions. Um, 
So really appreciate uh, your active engagement with us um, throughout this, this past year. I want to give a big shout out to the County Centenary Rotary Club. Uh, mm -hmm. They earlier this week, uh, a nice group of them, probably a couple dozen, um, surprised us here at the hospital. Uh, come, came out with these wonderful signs that they had handmade, um, just thanking and honoring and expressing their gratitude and appreciation to all of our healthcare workers. They worked with uh, El Rosal uh, Restaurant and provided us with over 500 burritos. Mm -hmm. Um, to serve um, all of our staff and and then they walked around um, the hospital um, shouting out uh, I was afraid they're gonna have their signs on sticks and people were gonna think they were picketing us but fortunately they didn't they were handheld signs and um, just a, a wonderful message um, to our staff and I know lots of folks were honking at them and um, it doesn't sound like much but uh, you can't imagine how uplifting it is mm -hmm. uh, to the spirits of all of our staff, just knowing that um, how much the community appreciates the good work they're doing. Um, so just thank you for everything you're doing and please continue to stay tuned. Continue um, sending us your excellent questions. And uh, you are um, you know, the ambassadors uh, for Quia Delta and we want you to feel incredibly informed with the truth and with facts um, so that you can help spread that information um, out there in our community as well. So I hope you all have a, a great restful weekend and we'll see you in a couple weeks. Can I share one thing, Gary, yeah. about the County Center Rotary? When we were walking around, some of them were sharing with me that they haven't been holding signs and marching around a building since the 60s. And it was bringing back <laughs> It was memories. nostalgic, huh? <laughs> it was. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for attending. Yeah, we appreciate it.